The Still Loading Podcast is brought to you by the wonderful people on Patreon. Amazing people like Kevin from the Bit by Bit Foundation, Eric H., Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, Stephen P., Ryan K., Mr. Biscuits, and Gilmer have all been wonderful enough to support the show over there. So if you would also like to get your name read at the beginning of an episode, along with a bunch of other goodies, go over to patreon.com slash stillloadingpod and check out everything it has to offer. On this episode of Still Loading, Everybody and welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval, and today's episode kicks off a three-part series, a three-part celebration of one of the most important games of all time. That's right, if you couldn't tell by the title, we're talking about World of Warcraft, originally released on November 23rd, 2004. And when this comes out, at least on the free feed, because it'll be out, it'll, it will have been out, excuse me, a couple days prior on Patreon. This is the 24th, so just one day later. So we are celebrating 20 years and one day of World of Warcraft. Uh, that is insane to think that this game is still going on and it's it's incredible so the next three weeks uh, you know three weeks including this one we're going to be spending time looking at world of warcraft this first episode is all going to be about the original world of warcraft pre any expansions nilla for all you fans out there for everyone who played it or vanilla if you want to call it nilla warcraft we're going to be diving into that so joining me to discuss nilla and everything that surrounds it two returning guests but it has been quite some time since they have been on the show i'm actually going to start off with the guest i think who is it's the longest it they haven't been on the longest it's been a a longer return i can't speak it's been way too long since they've been on tristan my buddy tristan one of my uh friends who has been on the show for all the uncharted episodes with the exception i think of i had bill for uncharted golden abyss bill from gaming collecting but tristan has been on the show for a while but it has been a good while since he's been on tristan how are you doing today uh i am good and i forgive you for not having me on for golden abyss because I have it on my shelf, but I have never actually played it. You, you wait. You still haven't played it. I have not. I have not. Yeah, I wasn't uh, super into the the little Vita joysticks for a uh, for a shooter. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, okay. It's a, it's an okay game. You know what? I I've been dying to cover another Vita game. So if you're interested in like Tearaway or Gravity Rush, I'm still looking for guests for one of those. Oh gosh, I haven't played those either. Oh my gosh, you're killing me. I basically well, got it for Persona 4. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I still have I, I, I have not played Persona 4 yet. Anyway. Yeah, there Tristan, you go. Hit me up for Persona game. <laughs> there we go. I've been actually trying to play Persona 3, and I got stuck. Anyway, this is another conversation. But Tristan, <laughs> thank you for joining me. Uh, pleasure having you back on. Looking forward to talking about World of Warcraft. And the other... Uh, returning guest who has been on the show for Final Fantasy VI for the ranking of the Final Fantasy VII characters, uh, my good friend Jamie Whistler. Jamie, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Doing good. I'm glad to be on the classic episode, to be honest. Oh, Burning well, Crusade and Wrath is great, but uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about classic. 
Well, it yeah. also just makes me super, super old talking about 20 <laughs> years of it. I know, right? Mm. Uh, and that's why, uh, what is it? Um, we, um, I, when I asked uh, all the people that I, you know, the people that I, that got me into WoW or I played WoW with, I was like, well, what's your favorite expansion out of these three? Because we're only, I'm not going to do an entire month. I, I usually do three episode arcs because I have my, uh, my car- video game cartoon retrospective episodes with Dexter Morrill at least once a month. So uh, I figured it's a perfect thing to do to do WoW through Lit, Wrath of Lich King because as we'll get into in Wrath of Lich King when that episode comes up and when I record it, that was when I first started playing was in Wrath. So that that expansion personally has a lot of nostalgia and a lot of personal connections to it. But uh, yeah, thank you both for joining me. I'm look, I've been looking forward to this. To kick this off, we're going to start off with just our personal recollections of WoW, like how we first got into it. I already kind of gave mine, and I'm going to kind of keep my story of getting into wow for the wrath episode for the most part um so i'm going to save my story i just will say it at the top here that's when i got into it and you'll hear more about it in that episode so i'm going to throw it over to both of you to talk about how you first got into world of warcraft and uh what are some of your earliest memories so we're going to start off with you tristan let's what what's how did you first get into the game and what are some of your earliest memories so in probably like junior high or high school um, I remember I was playing a lot of Guild Wars with a couple mm-hmm. of my friends, and so that was like the free alternative to WoW. Yep. Um, and just one of my friends finally ground me down and was like, "Listen, it's so much better. Like, even though it's fifteen bucks a month, like it's really cool." Mm-hmm. Um, and then I uh, I made a night elf because he was uh, he was Alliance. That was the only time that I've played Alliance. To be clear, mm-hmm. was uh, original <laughs> vanilla back in like. Oh yes, we're all horde players, by the way, listeners. We all play horde. <laughs> Tristan, it makes you feel better. I did the same thing. Yeah, my friends, my friends uh, got on my case because I was like, we, we just played this mythical game that has eight different races, and what did I pick? I was like, I want to be human. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't play anything more than level five, and they're like, this is dumb. We're switching to horde. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so we uh, we played on like a fairly low population server. Um, there was like maybe three guilds that were actually raiding, um, mm-hmm. but like I was able to get into one of them and I did up through, you know, like ZG and uh, Molten Core. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then like, I think maybe the first two bosses in BWL before I stopped playing, um, I didn't come back until uh, Burning Crusade had started at that point. Well, but here's an important question. When you say you picked a server and started, what kind of server? Uh, it was a PvP server. Has to be PvP. I, I wouldn't accept anything other than PvP. <laughs> w- World PvP was the very best that game had to offer in Classic. I'd be so upset if it was a PvE server. See, you, you're a glutton for punishment, though, Jamie. You you love the whole like give and take of like trolling other players and i'm not about that life i think i did pvp as well but i have never been a fan of it i hate the idea of just like you're just trying to level up and some assholes just like i'm just going to kill a bunch of low levels just because it'll be funny for me that shit always gets me that's a chain reaction let me let me let me take you about a place called hills brad foothills my man (laughs) (laughs) and the and the adventures that would ensue you wouldn't get anything done for hours some somebody ganks you all right uh that they're level five the they're five levels ahead of you because alliance players always were higher level and horde always ran around the alliance would kill a horde player a horde player would cry a high level horde player would come kill that low level alliance they do the same thing and for about two or three hours from five o'clock until eight or nine o'clock you would just have people smashing each other and <laughs> this was before the honor system so there was no no gains nothing happened except just the sheer reputation of destroying the other faction (laughs) pvp is where it's at 100 percent. i had immense pleasure being in my uh, like full tier one hunter going out to hills brad and firing off a multi-shot and getting like triple crits (laughs) just like one shotting like level 32s that are running around out there (laughs) it's vengeance that's what it is yeah because you you were you were ganked so you come back and you do the ganking (laughs) yeah i never started the fights I would, you of know, course not. You occasionally finish, finish them. them. Yeah, you just you just stand in that broken ass watchtower waiting for somebody to do something. A hundred percent. 
Well, the, Jamie, let's throw it over to you. Let's hear your, some of your earliest memories of World of Warcraft and how you got into the game. All right. Well, mine was even before the game launched. I was actually just pleased that it came out. Um, when they announced that, I was all about it. I was the kind of guy who was just watching the clock counting it down because we started playing Warcraft 2 mm-hmm. when probably a year or two after it came out. I mean, yeah, we were, we were kids. We were real young playing Warcraft 2. They, they didn't even have like attack move back in those days. It was just awful. But we played Warcraft 2. Loved it. We were awful at it, but loved it. And then when Warcraft 3 came out, we played that to death. And then they, you know, of course, had Warcraft 3. Um, the expansion that went to it that really went deeper into the characters. But, you know, Blizzard knew what they were doing. They flushed out the entire world, the entire maps. If you look at some of their maps from Warcraft 3, you know, they took that sketch and imported into the World of Warcraft. So they had everything planned, you know, of course, years before the world came out. Um, So when they announced World of Warcraft, it was an easy, yeah, everybody we know was jumping on it. We had four or five of us just rolled in there day one, didn't stop playing and probably until yeah the end of cataclysm no no wow. no i'm sorry the start of cataclysm is when we stopped playing it finally but uh you know we knew all the characters we knew who everybody was it was cool to visit the world so that was uh we, we got into it well before the game even came out that's really cool i i i missed all of that era of blizzard's history you know i i never even really knew warcraft was an rts until i played oh. wow because i played starcraft i knew about starcraft and diablo because mm-hmm. you know other friend of the show which all three of us know uh justin um who's been on the show a bunch of times he's the one that got me into well, the original co-host uh justin got me into starcraft and and diablo but uh warcraft was never on his cut like on his radar or at least he didn't talk about it i should say so when i got into world of warcraft i actually went back and played a little bit of warcraft 3 to get some of the lore for the backstory of arthas and everything with with wrath of lich king which is kind of cool so Um, good you can't have an appreciation for the undead for the forsaken without playing it our queen lady sylvanas the Never lore <laughs> of of wow is actually pretty fun to like look into uh, it's pretty well executed considering like they like one of the things i looked up when i was doing some research on this is that they had to find they had to create lore reasons for a lot of the stuff in world of warcraft so there is a lot of retrofitting with it which isn't necessarily a bad thing like they would have to retcon some things here or there but it's kind of impressive at how well they were able to integrate integrate it all in without like knowing exactly uh what was going to be what because you know world of warcraft it started development in like i want to say 2001 it was announced at a european trade show in 2001 um so it like it was announced three years prior which means they, they had been working on it for uh, a little bit you know a little bit before that even um I want to say development started in like the late nineties or so. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because whenever they came out with Warcraft, uh, I forget exactly which year that was. I think it was like 2000 Warcraft three. I mean, so actually they they knew what they were doing. They put actually, I can give you a better time frame of it. I don't have a specific time frame, but here's the reason I can give you a better time frame. So one of the things I looked up was, uh, after Starcraft had come out, after the original StarCraft game came out, the StarCraft team split into two different groups. One group would go on to make WarCraft 3. The other group started making a game that eventually became scrapped, and so they switched gears and then switched over to WarCraft and switched over to World of WarCraft. What was that, so, Ghost? StarCraft Ghost? Uh, maybe. Maybe. It didn't the mention... StarCraft Ghost was definitely the game that got scrapped, and what a shame that was. But, yeah, that's but, when, but when did it get scrapped? When was StarCraft Ghost announced? That's... You can look it up, actually. They came out with a whole intro trailer for it. Um, it looks really good, but there's it was a, a gameplay. Uh, well, StarCraft, it was announced in 2002, so I don't think it was this. Mm. Um, if they announced WoW in 2001, they probably started working on it in like 99 or 2000. Um, considering this was announced in 2002, they wouldn't have scrapped... The, it, it, I, I think it was probably a different game. I don't, I don't know what it was. They didn't mention which game it was. But uh, there there is obviously some overlap between Warcraft 3 and WoW in terms of development because Warcraft 3, what is it? It was a, it came out in like, what, 
it was announced 2000 or 2000 yeah it was like 2003 warcraft 3 came out and it was announced in like 2002 or something so there there's a there was a smidge of overlap in development time which makes sense because they were clearly planning the arthas storyline in wow for a while um but yeah so um it they learned when they first started developing world of warcraft they learned a lot from previous mmos they they looked at the grinding of everquest they tried to figure out well how could we make that more fun and more engaging they looked at the the pvp aspects of ultima how could they that make that more fun and engaging they based it off the world of warcraft 3 as we've talked about already um and sorry warcraft 3 was released in july of 2002 excuse me so oh, wow. That that and since they announced WoW in two thousand and one, there's at least a year overlap or so. Um, so, like I said before, after StarCraft was finished, the team split, and that's the one team would go on to make WoW. The game was actually championed by Blizzard co-founder Alan Ad- Adheim or Adham, excuse me, A D H A M. I was I I found like a small article on Adham and this dude is like a fucking legend. Like I I can't believe I I haven't like dug more into the history of Blizzard. So Alan Adham learned to start code. He started to learn to code, excuse me, in high school alongside his bre- his best friend Brian Fargo. Brian Fargo would go on to create Interplay Productions, which are the creators of the Bard Tale series and Wasteland. And he oh, also cool. He Those also games. worked. He also during some uh, during the summer he did programming work with uh, for Interplay Games. So he he actually had his hands on games like Demons Forge, Mind Shadow, and Global Commander. Uh, Adham had, and so once Adham graduated college, uh, he des- he decided to create a new studio, and he picked the best students in his engineering department, which ended up being Blizzard co-founders Mike Morheim. Morheim and Frank Pierce, and that's how Blizzard was born. Um, which that's a whole nother episode to go in the history of Blizzard, but I thought that was interesting. Like, I had no idea that uh Alan Adham was kind of the progenitor of Blizzard, like, he was the one that kind of set everything up, and his best friend set up one of the like founded one of the other most like influential PC gaming development studios, <clears throat> excuse me, with the people who made Wasteland and Bardstale. Uh, a lot of WoW's early concepts were taken from previous MMOs and tweaked. EverQuest Death Penalty, for example, they the death penalty in WoW, as you know, when you die in WoW, you ha- you're a ghost and you have to run back to your body. The, you did the same thing in EverQuest, but you could still take damage and get attacked, from my understanding. So... It was kind of like fighting an uphill battle. You also didn't have any weapons when you died in EverQuest. So they like when you when there's a death and when you die in EverQuest, you're fucked. Like you, it is a hard uh, time to get back to your body. Um, That's crazy. The, the only other MMO I ever played was uh, Ashron's Call. Boy, that was a a fun empty world. What's at what, who? What is Ashron's Call like a D and D type of thing or no, just another another old very old MMO okay um no real quests it just kind of you just wander around leveling up so um, uh, War, warcraft was definitely uh the best mmo and has been of course since for quite some for, time well it's funny for, actually for everything leveling up questing story they they definitely nailed it with every aspect of the original game well funny you mentioned questing because that's something that apparently everquest did not have it was a lot more free form you had to go and find stuff to do mm-hmm. and wow didn't really you know they they're like well we need to give players purpose something to do and uh, something to explore and kind of let the end of the game be that whatever quest was which is this just do what you want like there's no more quests per se like you could do quests even if they don't really benefit you in terms of a level anymore they added quests into the game they also uh fixed enemy zoning because apparently in everquest if you were in a zone and you and you aggroed an enemy mob they would chase you the entire time until you got out of the zone so imagine like being in like fucking you know uh let's like what's a giant ass location? Imagine you're in like <laughs> the Barrens, yeah, the Barrens, like Barrens. Right? and you have Southern to Southern Barrens. You got to run all the way north. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to find the quickest way out of the zone in order to the the mob will chase you the whole way. 
So, wow, fix that by having areas that they would follow you to. So, you know, as we all know, as we've played, we've run away from mobs at least once when we're panicking and almost near death. And so you, you run as far as you can and hope that you don't grab any other mobs. Um, yeah, so that's just some of the quick fun facts that I have. I have some other stuff that I'm going to be able to tie in later to... Uh, when we get to classes and other stuff. Oh, one other thing, rested experience. That was something new uh, that they added. And apparently when they originally added rested experience, they they, they kind of did it in a dumb way where if you weren't rested, you would get half experience. But if you were rested, you would get the full experience. And understandably so, players were kind of cranky about that. So they changed it to having it you get full experience if you're unrested and then you get bonus experience when you're rested, which it on a mechanical level, it serves the same purpose, like in terms of game mechanics, but having changing that verbiage, changing that, that language makes the player feel more empowered as opposed to you're, you're literally uh, punishing me for just not being rested. Didn't you also have to log out in an inn too, or a city or am I just Uh, imagining that? Yeah. To get rested. Yeah, you did, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... Rested would work better in that initial uh, implementation if it was like, oh, you could go to the inn and, like, pay the innkeeper, like, I don't know, 20 silver or something and go, like, sleep in the bed for five minutes and be like, great, I'm rested. I thought that... Yeah, definitely remember, like, in the Baron specifically when I had little characters, like, stopping and, like, parking my guy in the inn all the time. Yeah, well, because it it feels more like time-gating. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, I need to log out in the inn, and then I'll come back and I'll have a little bit of rest experience. But like, if I want to make the most of my time in game with like the best experience generating, I need to be logged out for like three days and then come back, and then I can do my like two levels of rested. You want to talk about best experience game in the game? You just do dungeons. That game was. <laughs> oh, we'll get into the dungeons. But real quick, uh, to what you're saying, Jamie, about like, do you have to rest in inns? You don't have to, but you get more rested experience in inns. Like, I don't know if that was something they changed at some point, but I do remember like if you just like logged out in the middle of like nowhere, you would get like it was like barely any rested experience. But if you logged out in an inn and you had the little like next to your little character bubble window in the icon that had little z's that was going that's up there. right that's how you knew that wherever you signed out you were going to get rested um like a lot of rested or a much more rested experience and the reason they did it is exactly what you said tristan it was time gaining it is because they found one of the things they were they did not anticipate when they were testing the game and seeing how other players played was that some people would just log on for days and never log off and just play. And they're like, this isn't healthy. Um, <laughs> so we need to incentivize players to take a break. And so rested experience became a way to incentivize players to take a break because that's exactly silly. what you said. And it, it I, I mean, I think that's a morally sound idea to do. They're trying to look out for the best interests of their players. They are trying to save the players from themselves. As nah, a if that were the case, it wouldn't give you so many classes, so many races, and then give every of those classes unique class, or unique quests to unlock all their stuff. You can I mean you could play that game for like a month straight and still not get every class. Well, I, I know mean, that, you but, could like once it, you know like, how, but but it's still incentivizing you. It gives you an incentive to take a break as opposed to none. You know what or I mean? Gives you that incentive to just play your ult while your main <laughs> gets oh, rested. That's, that's, that's right. perfect to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple other things here. The uh, Adam did uh, leave the company before the game released. He left in 2003 because. It burned him out. Um, it, it completely burned him out. He did. He did not really enjoy making games anymore, and so much so that it wasn't until like 2016 that he came back to Blizzard and back to the games industry. I don't know if he's still with Blizzard, but it, it took him like over a decade to kind of decompress from the stress that he experienced developing World of Warcraft. Um, I do and, remember that actually. I do remember when he came back in 2016. Everybody being really excited about that, and then when all the older um developers and like the senior blizzard staff left everybody said it was a changing of an era you know and of course then i got bought by activision and all that stuff but yeah it was it was a it was a crazy time when the ogs were there you can definitely tell when they were there and when they weren't there Mm. Mm. 
And uh, the last thing I have, and the, the, this is legitimately the last thing I have now that I'm at the end of my my notes sheet. Um, this is just a real fun fact with the art direction. Apparently, uh, they they had a hard time nailing down what they wanted the art direction to be, like the overall aesthetic of the world, because was it going to be realistic? Was it going to be cartoony? Like, how did they want, like the distinct wow style to come around and the first building that they they ever designed they, they hand painted it you know in like i guess 3d modeling or whatnot and it was a, a farm building from westfall mm-hmm. and the farm building in westfall helped basically inform the entire style of world of warcraft which i think is kind of interesting yeah westfall but, was actually the very first zone they ever created and all of their development for the game took place in westfall it's the most flushed out little region and area because that's where everything they they put together and built was tested there so westfall is the original area the very first area in the game okay i, d- I did not know that um, but all right, that, that's all the little fun fact backstory things that I have for now, with the exception I have one other thing to bring up when we get to classes. But um, let, let's dive into this, shall we? Um, I'm going to throw it over to you, Jamie, here. Uh, you know, this game, it is an RPG, so you pick a class and a race. It's, it's definitely obviously inspired from Dungeons and Dragons to a minor extent. It doesn't play like D&D, obviously, but you pick a race, you pick a class. And, uh, and that kind of informs what type of character you're going to be and what you can do throughout the rest of the game. So, Jamie, why don't you talk about just some of the classes in this game? Sure. Um, I mean, I'll talk about my favorite classes. You know, of course, we, we messed around with a whole bunch of them because you didn't really get much information. This is the kind of game where you, know, you installed it because it was the four disc install and then you would read the pamphlet and the manual and they kind of mm-hmm. give you like an overview of the classes. So I remember Warlock was my very first class and like my favorite class from classic. It was just a PVP heavy. And I didn't know that at the time. It was a very PVP heavy class. Um, You can handle multiple enemies at once. Players, creatures. I don't know. It was the best class ever. Vanek, Undead, Warlock. That's how it was. Um, And then my second favorite class and the class that I kind of fell back into when I picked up classic again was the uh, Orc Warrior tank of course nobody else is going to tank i might as well do it myself it's the only way i'm going to get through this game so i always love the forsaken war, war, uh, warlocks and the orc warriors so those are my favorite classes druids pass good <laughs> tristan good for you trying to pick a night elf or, or taran i couldn't do them i couldn't do druids i couldn't do either of those races their starting areas where they killed me yeah that's fair that's <laughs> but fair. the uh the undead start uh, that's that's the best start well, the the total there was a total of what is it uh, eight or nine different classes. You had druid, hunter, mage, paladin, priest, uh, nine different classes. Sorry, rogue, shaman, mm-hmm. warlock, and warrior. The shaman was exclusive to the horde, and the paladin was exclusive to the alliance. And just as a real quick uh, I, I, primer, I guess as it were, because we didn't really talk about it up top. Just for those who have not played it, there are two factions in World of Warcraft: um, the Horde and the Alliance. Horde are kind of like you know more humanoid-ish, I guess. Uh, humanoid and then, monsters. What? Sorry. Orc, troll, taran, bull. Yeah, people. And, and Horde are and more undead. kind of monstrous. Yeah, monsterish. Excuse me. Uh, and yeah, so the shaman could only be part of the Horde. And the Paladin could only be part of the Alliance until there was an expand until we get to the next expansion. But we'll get into that at a later time. Tristan, I want to throw it over to you, though. What are some of your favorite favorite classes? Uh, so I am a diehard hunter. Like any any Same. type of game like this, I'm going to play like the Ranger Archer type. Um, I did play Paladin in Burning Crusade. And I've uh, I like dabbled with uh, with Feral Druid and Frost Mage, and like both of those are pretty fun. I like Frost Mage. Yeah, Frost Mage is uh, a good one. But really, like I I always end up coming back to Hunter. I think even when I played Paladin, I got to a certain point in raiding, and I was just like, ah, I want to play a Hunter instead, and then I just never looked back. What kind of Paladin were you? Uh, I was the uh, the Rat Paladin. Yeah, there we go. Yep, Rat Paladins were great. They were good. I was yeah, also I a was, hunter. Uh, Sorry, finish what you're saying, Tristan. Yeah, no, I, I was terrible, Red Pally. But uh, really, because <laughs> like in 
in in the original like vanilla and burning crusade when like the internet was still young and you didn't have like you know wowhead or whatever that would tell you guides. everything and like youtubers going through guides on how to do everything it was just like i would just kind of do whatever i thought was good to stay alive but like even when i was healing playing holy during raids like i was just flash of light spamming which is apparently like <laughs> absolutely the last thing you should be doing all the aggro you're pulling and like yeah but like i'd be running out of mana and people would be like you're a paladin what are you running out of mana for And i'm like i don't know dude like i'm just casting the spells that i'm supposed to cast right <laughs> <laughs> Yo, classic classic without internet you're absolutely right it was a wild time to be alive man everybody was trial and erring everything hmm. quests were like hidden in secret i remember uh in Erythai highlands um we were blown away by the amount of times we did the Erythai highlands area and then found that there was like a cove in the back behind um behind the keep there there was a whole small little pirate cove back there that i would never have known unless you like, explored the world back in the time mm -hmm. i kind of missed that in a weird sense i remember back when i first played it i was annoyed at how little direction the quests gave you actually though I will say, and in 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 not in my defense, but in against me, uh, Jamie, you have always accurately pointed out that the quests tell you exactly where you need to go. <laughs> you just have to fucking read them. You just gotta read the directions. Read directions. <laughs> just Follow read the, the directions. And both me and uh, your brother Andrew, are like that's too much effort. Oh. And, oh no! As soon as he found um, the quest helper site, that's all he would do. That's all. Yeah, they would just. Yeah. Put the ad add on to our I forget what the I guess it was Wowhead back at the time, or still Wowhead, where they would tell you exactly where to go for every quest. And I was like, nah, 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 nah. You gotta read the quest. It tells you to go east, you haven't gone east far enough. Keep going. Well, yeah, they, then they added there was add-ons you could get for the game that would you know you could change your ui and stuff like that but one of them was also a quest tracker and then eventually wow it. just implemented their own and so that made that completely null and void um but it was still kind of cool um no real quick so I'm, I'm also a hunter i played that a lot i've also tried out a warrior and paladins before i've i've not played enough of I, any of them to really give like an honest opinion on it i've i've played a shitload of hunter tristan and i would do lots of raids in um in wrath which i'll save those stories for the wrath episode but uh we did actually do it was in wrath of lich king tristan and i would go back and do the nilla raids like the 10 man nilla raids oh sure uh, uh, zg remember tristan we would do zg yeah yeah <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a 20 player raid, but we would do ZG. And I'm just like, this is kind of cool. It, it's kind of funny. I, I look at that, right? And I'm like, no wonder I'm into video game history. Because one of the things I loved about it was like hearing all the stories of like, oh, this is what it was like back in Nilla. I'm like, wow. And it's so <laughs> stupid that I was even like that because that was like maybe four years prior. I'm like that yeah. was so long ago. And it was four years prior to the, when we were playing. Yeah, man, that would have been, I would have been playing my Paladin. So that I could like tank and heal and everything. Because mm -hmm. um, I definitely remember, I assume with you, we were like two or three manning uh, Anixia. Uh, something. I don't know if we ever did Anixia together. I think that might have been a little bit too, because that was a 40 player raid. We might yeah, have tried that, it. I mean, it's like your still, first if you were band, doing you know? it, if you were doing it in Wrath of the Lich King, you probably had no problem. Well, the amount of health you jumped up was so yeah, significant. Yeah. It's it's Anixia and like Molten Core were were and Black Wings Lair and stuff. Those were the intense ones. Um, oh, I did I did do a little research too. The the other big rage, the Ruins of Encourage. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank they, you. That was like you know that was one of the first like big events where they had uh, players meet and you could see the gates of the gates. Sorry, the gates of AQ open up, and they were panicking about it though because they had never had at one point in time all the players in the exact same zone at the exact same time and so like we don't know how our servers are going to be able to handle this we've never tested this type of thing before which was kind of funny to to hear them talk about that that was something that was very stressful for them leading up to that that raid which i thought was kind of funny yeah man oh, yeah. even even in classic so you know like what four years ago at this point when the gates of aq opened it was a shit show. Like, it was super, super framey. Everybody was rubber banding around. Like, it it was a bad time. 
because the server just couldn't keep up with how many players were hanging out there. That's just wild to think that it's still like even all these years later. Yep, it's still a problem. They it still is really taxing on their servers to do. Uh, it's funny though. I I loved though. We also did AQ solo, like or not solo, like but you and I ran that together as well, Tristan. Like yeah, just we, going we through a lot done, of the old ones. We would have done AQ twenty because yeah. that's what I was. That's what I had been familiar with from having actually played back in vanilla. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think we went to AQ forty at all. I don't think so either. I think because the the they're. A lot of the forty man raids were pretty challenging for us at level eighty in in, in wrath. Like, just because it, you know, once again, it is level sixty, but it, you're expected to have forty to sixty players to do it. So, mm. it, I'm sorry, not sixty, forty players to do it. Like right. that's insane. Um, yeah, well, classic was even harder. That's why I oh, never, yeah. I actually never truly raided back in the 2004, 2006 when I was playing it. You know. Because I didn't have the time to sit there and have somebody organize a forty man raid. That's that's wild. Classic. Guild, it's nuts. Guild leaders might as well be doing government work now. <laughs> oh, for sure. It's a whole it's a whole second job to manage people. They're like little managers at like a like a restaurant, like a quick like a I don't know. You got to like schedule everybody. You got to have the right roles. You got to make sure everybody can show up. You got to take in consideration their family. Like my mm-hmm. brother in law is actually. Um, a guild leader for his guild. I forget what it is called now, but uh, he tells us all the time. Every week I check in with him. He's talking about people having family problems. They can't make this. They can't make that. So it's still just as ridiculous. It's easier now, but uh, it, it was just too wild back in the well, day. I didn't have the time. But when our, Classic rolled out, then I actually got around to Ragnaros. On our guild, Tristan, didn't we? Um, there They had their own website that you would have an account for and logged in and you would log into and sign up for the raids. And then the way that the, the loot system would work is that every raid that you attended, you got like a certain number of like tokens. And then when loot that you came up that came up that you wanted uh, would, would drop, you would yeah. then wage basically like it was an auction house. You know, I'm going to put like four tokens in or six tokens in or something like that. So they had, they had an entire like independent, like, like finance system, like money system in order for how you were supposed to like wager on what you wanted type of thing or what you could get. Yeah. Dragon kill points. That's what it was. Um, I think that was based from, from EverQuest, wasn't it? I actually never knew the origins of it. I just remember all the funny videos that came out. 50 DKP. <laughs> 50 DKP minus. <laughs> I'm going to look that up. Uh, DKP meaning, if I Google it real quick, Dragon Kill Points are a semi-formal scorekeeping system used by guilds and MMOs. Uh, yes, used originally in the MMO EverQuest, Dragon Kill Points are the points that are awarded to players for defeating bosses and redeemed for items that the bosses would drop. Oh, there you go. Yeah, because there there weren't really any dragons until Anixia and BWL. So wasn't yeah. super there, early. Wasn't there dragons that like flew around the maps though that you could do like world bosses? You had to in order to unlock the uh um wow, I'm blanking on it. The end dungeons. Oh my gosh, Black Rock Depths. In order to unlock them, because you had to form keys to get into those dungeons, Mm -hmm. you had to actually get your guild to go around the world. And there was, I think, three or four um, world dragons you had to kill. And once you slayed them all, um, it would, you know, you had to complete the quest to progress unlocking the key. So there were world dragons. Interesting, because I'm pretty, at least as far as classic goes, I think the world dragons came out several patches in at that point i think we had already cleared mc and i i want to say bwl before the world dragons were a oh. well were you a mean thing. you probably did more than me because like i said i never really made it to end game rating the very first playthrough it's only when i played classic again did we uh did i actually walk through that process and do everything yeah yeah because i don't i don't particularly remember what all you needed to do to get into black rock depths or like because i know there's other keys in there because like that instance is enormous right it's like huge. it's what it's you like had to do is just have a friend who already had it that's right. how you do it <laughs> right but i don't 
I don't think you had to mess with like the you know air quote proper world dragons that there were four of them that took like forty people to kill. Um, there may have been other smaller ones around that were part of those. Maybe quests. that was maybe that was just for Ragnaros to unlock his area. It's the details I'm a little fuzzy on. Mm. It's been it's been a couple of years since I did classic, but I just know that there were world dragons. I remember like seeing them. I thought it was such a cool idea, but that there's these dragons that people would just basically compete over, like who could get to them the quickest. And then, cause there was also like, there was an art as to who would like aggro well, the dragon and like, cause it wasn't even necessarily what, like who got the first hit. It was who did the most damage to it. So you had two different, like, guilds from my understanding i once again i did not experience this just dpsing the shit out of this dragon trying to see which party could out damage the other uh, oh no it was definitely it was definitely a tagging system in that game for sure yeah, i think the yeah, issue, whoever tagged it got it right was it it, i could have sworn it was you're more damage the other guild everybody dies. in the other guild dies and then yep whoever on your team had last hit it would get the tag uh, okay yeah, it was the same way with um, quests, too. Like, if there was, like, a, a named creature and somebody tagged it, you kind of just watched. If you knew it was a long respawn time, you just kind of hope they died. You don't want, you don't help, you just watch it. Mm -hmm. And with like the world dragons, was... like, they'll die. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> they'll die. I'm, I'm thinking of the one in Duskwood that, like, would sprout all these, like, poisonous mushrooms and shit, and, like, nobody would know what was happening, and everybody would just be, like, poisoned and dying, and you'd be like, I mean, we got him, like, 25% dead. I guess that was an okay attempt, right? <laughs> I just, I, I love those things. That's one of my favorite things that I love about, old, like, Nilla Wow, because, like, even though, like I said, didn't play it when it was contemporary, but I had to play through it to get to Wrath. This was before Cataclysm, where they completely changed everything up. Um... But I, I always remember that. I also hated with how the mobs spawned in that, like, because once you got so many players and you have one of those quests where you have to kill, like, you know, get this, you know, kill this uh, special mob, like some type of cheetah or lion or whatever the fuck. Um, and then you would have to, like, uh, try to oh, be the I can first already, one to kill I can it. already... I already know you're talking about Stranglethorn Vale. <laughs> but not even that, just in general. Like it, it could it could be anywhere. But then all, that would add a second, uh, like a like a extra layer to it for the hunters because if you could tame that, then it was like there was like that bragging right of, of like oh my pet I got a rare pet like you know this is different than like it's not just a regular ass tiger or a cat like I got this rare rare one. I remember. I mean, I haven't logged into my account in forever, but my hunter, my main hunter, if assuming it, no one has hacked my account and sold off all my parts, um, I had one of the, it's it's from Wrath of Lich King, but that like ghost tiger with the light, or no, the lightning wolf, the lightning wolf. Mm -hmm. Skull? Yeah, that took forever to get. Yeah. Yeah, I had been, when I was starting to play Classic again, I had hopped onto my retail character. And that wasn't one that I had gotten on my hunter before. I had, I think, there was like the leopard one from the, what was it, Sholazar Basin. And then there was like another one that was like a see-through bear from uh, one of the other places out there. But mm. I hadn't gotten Skull, and I was still like logging in every other day to just be like, I'm just going to make the rounds to see if Skull's here doing the rounds now when you play a warlock you don't need to worry about any of that back in the day all you do is you get your uh your infernal you drop that right in the middle of the barons and you just watch everybody panic <laughs> you lose control of that and you just watch the fun um what are some of your favorite you know actually hold on before we go to what i was going to ask let's let's round out the um chat about the generic gameplay we talked about different classes there's there is uh, eight different races as well. There was for the alliance there was dwarves, gnomes, humans, and night elves. And for the horde there are trolls, taran, orcs, and forsaken. Forsaken are basically just zombies, kind of like skeletons, and taran are like cow people, like anthropomorphic anthropomorphic cow people, pretty much. Um, and each had different you know strengths and weaknesses and all that other stuff but some some class some uh races were better for certain classes even though like 
but like for example like orcs you could be a hunter but it might not always be the best compared to like a troll or a tarn or something along oh, no. those lines orcs are definitely the best hunters they had that five percent damage buff from pets for sure that was but trolls yep. had five extra uh bow skill so you didn't need oh, as much I, hit percent what are you talking about bow skills you got that troll regen mm. <laughs> you know you never noticed that also that's back way in the day where you actually had to use your weapons skill yourself up that was always fun oh mm -hmm. my god yeah i forgot about that you would mm -hmm. just you would just go to like a low level mob area and like if you have like a zero skill and like short swords yep. you're like all right i'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes just whacking Hitting. at this thing until i hit it and, and kill it see i would yeah, be in again in classic as a hunter i was able to solo farm uh one of the uh one of the dire mall bosses like all the way through to the end nice mm -hmm. and there were just like little ghost elves that would be standing there that you can hit but it doesn't do any damage so like Every other run, if I had to go AFK, I'd be like, uh, I don't have any arm, arm skill. Like, I'm just going to punch this dude for 20 minutes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you just go AFK and you come back and you're like, all right, 300, let's go. That's amazing. Yeah, I remember um, as much as I loved Warrior, that was always the biggest pain in the butt. You know, you do the sword, you do the axes, you do the pole arms. You just got to sit there and swing. Such a drag. That's the one big thing I'm, I'm happy they removed. The, I, I I like that they they added a lot of quality of life things. I do kind of miss and it, it, to go back to the quest chain thing that we were talking about before. I I understand having like the automatic quest finder is nice, but I do genuinely think by adding that in there, then you're disincentivizing the player from exploring the world you've created more. Well, um, kind of. Blizzard has always done this thing. World of Warcraft, Warcraft specifically has always done this thing where they don't actually develop most of their tools. Um, they created their UI. They had what was in Classic, but then the community goes out and they do the mods, like the quest tracker. And like you said, it's not necessarily that Warcraft stole it from them. They just saw that everybody downloaded the mod. So then they said, okay, it exists. We'll integrate it. And like that's how they've integrated most of their stuff. Like mm -hmm. Warcraft doesn't actually do anything. They wait for a mod to get super popular and then maybe integrate one or two pieces of it. But even in retail now, you, people are still heavily relying on mods to change their configuration, their screens, their buttons, uh, because they're just not. Like Warcraft just isn't worried about that because of so many mods out there. So Quest Tracker was one of those few ones that they actually built into it. They also did the the looking for dungeon thing later on, but that's like looking for group. Yeah, I think that was Burning Crusade. Well, no, no, no. But like I'm talking about there is like, you know, the automatic thing where, you know, because before they had the looking for group channel, I guess I didn't know that mm -hmm. wasn't added until BC. But oh, no, I'm talking about that one there. But I'm yeah, talking the, about the thing that like that, that you finder. could go wait in a queue and then they yep. would just put you with a group of random people that didn't exist when I first started. No, and I'm pretty sure that was Burning Crusade. They, they introduced the group finder. I believe it was actually the either old war or icc patch in wrath of the lich king is when that came out is it really that far yeah i had been i have been keeping up with the the like warcraft classic subreddit even though i haven't been playing you're and absolutely of, right yeah and a lot of people were lamenting the fact that once classic gets up to that point in wrath that you're losing that sense of community of like mm -hmm. actually having to go out and look for people and like looking back at it in, at that time, I was like, oh my god, thank you so much for having Group Finder. I don't have to like spend half an hour spamming the, the chat to find people. Um, but like having played Classic... 31 on, Hunter, looking for group yeah, yeah. <laughs> accuracy. You know, like whatever your class was. I mean, or not class, whatever your skill, uh, whatever tree uh, you decide to go into. But, but having played Classic on a fairly high pop server where like people are actually looking for groups on a regular basis and it was a lot easier to like get in with people and like it really did foster a sense of community of being like oh don't group with that asshole he's a ninja and like you know nobody's gonna group with them even you see him spam and everybody's like nah fuck that guy oh um, yeah you're, you're, you're absolutely like, right but then you're like oh this guy he's from like a reputable guild like i'm sure he'll probably be cool and then you know you actually have like a, a really full friends list for people that you can hit up if you need like a tank or something isn't that just so surreal to think about the fact that like there there was 
there was reputable guilds and non-reputable guilds. Like you literally had factions within the faction of like, you know, the, oh, these people were cool. These people aren't. There was almost a hierarchy just based off of like, you know, which guild could like clear like the raids the quickest or had the best players or this. It just It's so surreal seeing like this entire, like what's fascinating about World of Warcraft besides just the, from a gameplay standpoint is just, how much it fostered a sense of another world like it, it really felt like that hey this is a this is a world that's completely different from your own but it has a lot of the trappings of that you're accustomed to there's you know i mean for better or worse a class hierarchy you know like which guilds were the best which weren't type of thing um but it you know there was like you kept like you were saying trust in the community aspect you know don't partner up with this person they're an asshole or even just like um kind of like the those random things where like you would have to the the raids against the enemy factions uh capital cities and stuff like that oh, like those are fun getting a whole group of people just be like let's just fucking do this and see if we can survive um yeah, i you never do that in the middle of the night two two three yeah. o'clock in the morning on the server when nobody was on and Tristan, yeah, you man. did that in, in wrath right oh sure yeah well there was a Oh, uh, there's like an in-game achievement to kill like all of the like, the leaders the, of the, the Horde and the Alliance. Yeah, yeah. you get your yeah. like bear mount or something. Yeah, it was a bear mount. Um, and actually, you know, we can this is a we can use that as a transition. Talk about some of the various elements outside of just you know the, your class and your abilities and your combat. And actually, real we didn't really talk about individual abilities of the classes, which is fine. That's like. That's so nitty gritty. We'd be here for hours breaking down oh, yeah. every single class's abilities. But the thing I wanted to bring up before that I thought was interesting was that um, a lot of the characters, uh, a lot of the class abilities were made by merging multiple hero abilities from Warcraft three. Um, so what I mean by that, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have a screenshot of an article I read and I, I have the exact quote here. Um, this is a quote from, do I have the name? Shoot. I don't know if I have the person's name who wrote the, who, who this quote is actually from, but there's a, I think the, the, there's an article in the history of world of Warcraft on like video games, 947 or VG 947. I'll have to, I'll I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone who's interested. And speaking abilities before we go on, um, just the the fun fact I wanted to bring up was that a lot of the abilities for the characters, they would take some of the hero classes from Warcraft three and they would merge a lot of those hero classes abilities into one class in world of Warcraft. So they would might take four or five heroes abilities and merge them all together. Um, because obviously you couldn't always, uh, you know, what is it in, in Warcraft three, what each hero had like what four abilities, right? Or something like yeah, that. Three abilities and all. Yep, so that that's not enough for a big MMO like World of Warcraft. So they had to find some way of of putting of basically making their job a little bit easier. So they did merge some of the abilities of multiple hero hero units from Warcraft Three to create abilities for individual character classes. Oh sure, and even they filled in their classes with a lot of skills. Like I remember the priest had tons of skills that were kind of silly and pointless um it, you know they had like mages had featherfall like mm-hmm. barely usable you know they're very situational um the priest always had mind control which was a really fun and easy and stupid way to kill somebody and mind control needles. someone off a ledge you know <laughs> right but like there was also like um spells that you breathe under water which were like very situational um like they had a lot of skills in classic that uh, they kind of did away with as time went on just because it's like, why? why? Why do we have these? Which were also pretty cool to have, though. I don't know. It kind of added flavor to the world, having those abilities. Yeah, I can remember uh, you have like multiple raids worth of people on the uh, little islands off the Stranglethorn Vale coast where the, the ZG vendors were. And somebody would be handing in their like head of a car to give everybody the buff. And then you'd have, you know, like six raids of 20 people running from that island over to the mainland. And each raid would have like a shaman casting water walking on each person. You would see them jump up out of the water so they could keep running. Yeah, those are the best. Yeah, it's, it's and I only remember, I remember some of those abilities were fun in the uh, uh, Erythite Highland Battlegrounds. Um, 
because like Featherfall, you could fall right from the lumber mill all the way down to the blacksmith. Or you could like water walk from blacksmith to the farm. It's super situational. But like those those little abilities were always fun to do. You do your uh, your goblin rocket boots and yes. your parachute click to get yes. from the lumber mill all the way down to the <laughs> the blacksmith. Yep. There is there was um Tristan, you and I did something like that because I, I the the goblin rocket shoes or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it I think it was in like either uh, AW or maybe in Nixia's lair. Um. I can't quite remember. There's like a section of that where we were, we were going through it together. And I think it was on your, you were on your pallet and I was on my, my hunter. And there's like this, basically it's a big like cavernous room with like lava at the bottom. And there's a stairwell. There's like the, you come in at the, you come in through an entrance at one side of the room. And if you look, it just kind of follows the entire wall and it, it, goes around to the other side of the room and it's lower on the other side and it exits and so we what we did was i don't know if this is like nilla or if this is like something later on but since you're on this episode i gotta bring it up um because we did it actually in a nilla raid um what happened was we freaking we we turned on like the jet boots ran and sprinted over the edge and then popped our cloak parachutes and we glided over the entire thing and landed on the other side. And I think I made it and you missed. It sounds like the entrance to Molten Core. It might yeah, have been Molten Core then. And it, it definitely was, sounds like it. But it was like, so that funny. kind of stuff was always fun, like the silly stuff you could do. Mm-hmm. I remember back in the, you know, even though I played in a PvP server, there was a lot of inexperienced players, like everybody was. You try and even communicate with like alliance players um and like try and decipher the languages they had like keck yeah. is always their lol and stuff like that like you just messed around with a lot of a lot of the fun stuff in the early games oh that's funny i didn't even there's the like the that's asian what... characters that say hell yeah brother <laughs> people be spamming in chat <laughs> that's amazing yeah there's um, a lot of fun stuff like that now we, we talked a little bit about the the raids and and various instances and whatnot uh, and dungeons what are some because there, there, there's a lot um but jamie i know you're a big uh dungeon fan what were some of your favorite dungeons in nilla wow oh man well obviously wailing caverns is a classic just because that was one of the the second one you did as a horde Wailing caverns is always a solid one i always loved shadow fan keep shadow fan keep was also a very good one i don't know i could i could do that one all day every day um but the other one that i really enjoyed was um uh, in the eastern plague lands Mm-hmm. And you visit uh, Stratholm. Um, oh Stratholm was yeah, amazing. yeah. Stratholm was fun. It. The the living side, the undead side. Um, Skolomance was okay. I mean, I enjoyed it. I ran it. It was it was a really great one for tanks to gear up in. But like, I could just run Stratholm, the living and the undead side, like all day every day, and just be completely happy with it. I actually did that for my warlock a lot before uh, I figured out like the end game rating. I was just like, oh, I'm level sixty. I'll just run this dungeon a hundred thousand times and not really get anything new. Yeah, when I very first played it. But then once I replayed it with my warrior, uh, we did Skolomance, geared up, um, and just uh, there was a period of time where I was a, a paid tank. You were talking about like having a community. Mm-hmm. So when Classic Re came out a couple years ago, um, I would do two professions just mining professions mining and leatherworking i think is what i did so i would collect and sell in the auction house and then at a certain point when we hit end game i would just pay to run groups through scolomance and um strathome you know it was like 100 gold per run they'd give it to me and i was like right, easy easy half hour let's go and i would just do it over and over oh that i see i never really did i that's what i would usually used to do when the first mmo i ever played like just kind of like what i mean by what i used to do is like you know selling resources i wouldn't even play any of the dungeons or anything that i would just like do the the profession and i would just sell a bunch to get money um uh oh my gosh runescape tristan remember runescape RuneScape. oh man you would just buy you would mine a shitload of moonstone and then you i think it was moonstone and then you would sell it for like 20 g a pop or whatever the currency is in there (laughs) there was some dude that like sat at this one spot in the world that was i don't know like near the bank or something 
And he was like, I am going to be making a bunch of really fancy runes, but I need just minions oh, to mine stone, the not raw material. Stone. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then, so like, yeah, the number of, of hours that I spent, like, you know, trying to beat other people over to like the nodes that were spawning so that I could give this guy a bunch of these stones to get a bunch of money so that I could buy myself some cool armor. And I was like, wow, that was fun, I guess. <laughs> it, I, it's just, it's so funny, like playing MMOs pre WoW, not, not that they came out pre WoW, though RuneScape might have. I don't know when RuneScape first came out, but in terms of like when I played it, like remember Night Online? Oh, do I? Do I ever? Lots of stuff like that. Uh, RuneScape came, originally came out in 2001, so it's it's still going strong too. That's what's wild. Like RuneScape is still going, which is bonkers to me. But um, anyway, uh, but then you know, going from RuneScape to Night Online, and then Night Online to like Guild Wars, uh, it just all all and stuff like that. I just I remember playing and progressing through all the different MMOs to finally get to WoW and be like, okay, I understand why this one is so much more popular than all the others. Like it is worth the fifteen dollars a month because it's so well crafted compared to all those other ones. Mm-hmm. God, I miss. Is Night Online even still a thing? Uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask Jordan. I think if any of us have have played it semi recently, it would have been him. Uh, it is still. It's officially free to play, but there are some features must be paid for. Uh, supposedly it is still going on. You can actually get it on Steam. Okay. All right. It's developed by M Game Corporation, but I can't find any information on M Game Corporation, at least not on Wikipedia. Mm. Well, if the player see. base was as any uh, indication, it's probably a Turkish company. Uh, no, it's actually Korean. Korean? <laughs> oh, well, that, I guess that shouldn't surprise me. I feel like the Koreans <laughs> have a lot of a lot of random MMOs that they put together. Yeah, I they forgot. really do, actually. Yeah, there was a, like, didn't you start learning Turkish like briefly from Night Online? I think we we learned like a handful of phrases just to be like, hey, could you buff me or like go away? This is my like farming area or something. Like, go away. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Um, but uh, Tristan, what about you? What are some of your favorite dungeons in in World of Warcraft and Nilla? Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like Scholomance is one that I have a a conflicting. Uh, feelings about because it's like it is a really cool dungeon but it's also really tight and I'm always playing a hunter so like you've got that minimum like distance before I can actually use my bow Um, but it was like it was always worth running for the gear Um, but like yeah Scholomance was or I'm sorry Strathalm was really cool Um, another tight one though like you really had to let me sorry tank yeah (laughs) <laughs> like i remember that all the time like i made sure with my warrior i had a gun or a bow mm-hmm. i was like just just everybody stand back give me 10 seconds and y'all join like i had to very make rules very clear to the randos i was playing with back then right. I was like, this is how we're gonna do this and we're gonna get through it yeah that one was a lot more fun to play as a paladin though because you'd have like a shitload of zombies and you could drop a consecration and like turn oh, undead yeah. and like all that or uh, priest being really cool they had shackle undead which always helped yeah 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 um there's a couple oh well like i mean black rock depths is super super cool um they're huge that was the only thing there, yeah that's, that, that always blew papers. me away huge. that like wow dungeons like nilla wow dungeons were not like like you know later on they'd be like 20 minutes like 20 to 30 minutes that was your dungeon but some of these would take like over an hour mm-hmm. yeah and you oh, had yeah. quests that would take you back there multiple times you'd have to re-clear it out um it was depths specifically, I believe, that had like the uh, the dark iron dwarves mm-hmm. and their bar. You had to go down there for and right. like, talk to a bunch of people. Yeah, it was oh, it was a whole thing, man. You don't do it once; you do it a ton. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Upper Black Rock Spire is another mm-hmm. one where you first meet uh, Nefarian. Now that I got a one. which which one because I'm pretty sure it was one of the Black Rock Spires that had the infamous, the iconic Leroy Jenkins, or was that That's... one of the raids? That That's would have been upper, right? upper yeah. It would have yeah. been upper. That's what I thought. I could have sworn. I mean, we have to at least talk, like, touch, not even touch on. There's not much more to say, except it was, like, one of the OG WoW memes. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that definitely. broke through outside of the WoW audience, I should say. 
<laughs> yeah, it was definitely a stage thing, but uh, it was the best. And if you ever played that, like, yeah, you could screw it up if, if somebody feared. Uh, but as long as you didn't fear, it wasn't that bad. It was okay. <laughs> yeah, just don't don't touch the eggs and everything's fine. Just, easy. You've, you've been walking your character in a straight line for 60 levels. Just do it now. <laughs> and Leroy decided not to do that. I think I we yeah, we know it's staged now, but I like get the time it was like, is this real? Did this guy really just do this? Oh, but so good. it's the delivery of it, man. It's it's the fact that when he yells Leroy Jenkins, he adds the letter M right before the J he goes, <laughs> Leroy Jenkins. Yeah, there's like a little like there's like he's going like a hmm sound effect right before he's going into Jenkins. He's satisfied with it. You know you got it big when Jeopardy had that as a question. Yeah. <laughs> Leroy. Oh man, it's so I it iconic. You can't That's even like iconic. you can't repeat that delivery. It's just it's so perfect. But I'm sorry, Tristan, I cut you off because uh, I wanted to talk about Leroy Jenkins. Was there what what other dungeons did you want to touch on? Oh yeah, I just I mean like with BRD uh, Black Rock Depths, that was never one that I was particularly a big fan of until I realized like how big and like how interesting like all the bosses were in there and you got like the like the Dark Iron Dwarf Emperor and his like daughter and shit that you could like have a quest from the other dwarves in uh I forget the the name of the zone outside of Right of MC, but like you know, they're they're sending and be like, oh, you got to go like rescue the princess, and but also there's like whole fire elementals that worship Ragnarok or uh, Ragnaros, and like oh, these, there's a like a gladiatorial pit in there that has random bosses and just like I love that. We would do that. You would run in there. You'd you'd clear out like the first six or seven mobs, do the arena, leave, reset the dungeon, do it again until you found like the one you were looking for. Mm-hmm. Those are good memories. Yeah, and like even like Dire Mall had a lot of really cool ones where there's like, I feel like the lore for the Dire Mall ones makes them worth running, but they're like kind of a pain in the ass. But that's like you know where like a bunch of the the high elves are all like ghosts and shit now, and like I don't know whatever Boo, uh, dark uh, dark machinations they were they were experimenting with like the the big like beholder dog and uh all the other like corrupted elementals and stuff over there was really cool that's dire some good mall, stuff for sure dire mall was in uh not on core sorry uh Pharellis? Yep. yeah 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 God, that was my favorite zone in all of nilla like oh, i yeah. loved Pharellis, just just purely based off visuals like the quest lines were okay and dire mall is a really cool i'm with you tristan i like the dire mall as a dungeon um but i just love i love the horde hideouts or the horde town in there specifically because it's like got this beautiful view of like waterfalls and stuff like that mm-hmm. um it's just such a cool town and I, I just I love Pharellis a ton. It's one of my favorite locations. Angora Crater was also really cool just because you could fight dinosaurs. You could fight dinosaurs, but you could also fight Alliance. Very PvP. I love that area. Yeah. Yeah. The- That's also the area where uh, they, they had all the Nintendo jokes until they had to not have the Nintendo jokes. Oh, yeah. And Mario, the Luigi, the Lincoln quest. Yeah, yeah. That was always a good one. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. The so, atmosphere. Yeah in in Feralis or Feralis. Uh I can remember the first time I went there in classic and it was like pouring rain and like the rain and the fog and I assumed that like you know when I played it back in like 2005 my computer was a piece of shit so like I didn't have the the graphics cranked up but then like playing it on a modern PC and having all those atmospheric effects happening and like the sound design of the rain pouring down and just like you can't see shit. All you can hear is the rain, and you're just like riding into the fog, hoping that nobody jumps you. It was just like super cool. It, like it hits just right. Frost is so damn cool, man. the 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 first like just this experience you kind of talk about, Tristan. The, the first time I ever like kind of felt like a wowed sense of like, oh my gosh, this game is like not what like excuse me, this game is like really uh cap like it like uh engaging what's the word i'm looking for like you you're able what sorry 
captivating Cap- captivating but also like uh immersive that's it yeah, yeah. immersing me was it was actually beginning in the very beginning so i you know i played an orc hunter so you start out in duratar uh and you are you know you start out in this canyon you're kind of exploring the, the troll and orc starting areas right next to each other and you walk up north to go to orgrimmar and Orgrimmar is one of the main capital cities. And so I, when I first played this, I was used to like how cities were shown on like console games, you know, how like Final Fantasy would show a city where the closest thing that I, I saw was like freaking the, the oh my gosh, I can't, I'm blanking on the name of it, but the big city in Final Fantasy IX where Sid is at, where like to Alexandria. No, 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 Alexandria is where you start. It's like, mm. I, I'm going to blank on it. Uh, I'll look it up real quick. Um, but it was just like, uh, it, when I first played that, I'm like, oh, this actually feels Lindblom. Lindblom, mm. there you go. I couldn't think of the name of it. When you go to Lindblom for the first time, like, oh, wow, this actually feels like a city. But it's also just, you know, 2D s- screens with a 3D character running around on top of it. When you're playing World of Warcraft and you, like, you are walking north from the south of Dorator to get up to Orgrimmar, you're walking through a canyon, right? And the canyon weaves a little bit, but for the most part, it's a straight shot. Um, and when you, when the canyon starts ending, there's a hill, you know, the hill steadily rising out of the canyon and the walls are s- slowly shrinking because you're, you know, you're walking out. And right the first time that I ever walked out of there an airship flew over my head and landed at one of the towers that are outside the walls I'm like what the hell is that like why is there there's airships at this game like what's going on here and then i walked through the doors of like the the big gates of orgrimmar and i saw like this was an actual city like there was houses and shops and like yeah it's not necessarily completely like fully like you know, life size or anything like that, but compared to what had come before where when you're in like a city in like a RPG, you make it like two or three screens and that's about it. Or you have to transition to a bunch of different screens. This was fully 3d that you could explore around it. And there was like five different districts you could go to or more than that even. And each one was unique in its own way or like had some type of aesthetic difference. And there was quest chains in each single one. And you, it, I, I, I was so captivated by it. It immersed me so much. I'm like, holy fuck, this is different than any other game I've played. Like I, I have such a, I had such a visceral emotional reaction to that, just being so amazed by it. And that's honestly like, I enjoyed WoW up until a certain. I enjoyed WoW well enough when I first started. That's what hooked me specifically, uh, and that's you know I don't once again played in Wrath, but this is part of Nilla. Like it would have done the same for me if I had walked up on Orgrimmar in Nilla and just seen that those giant no, no. walls. <laughs> Orgrimmar was not nearly as impressive. They did a good job with Orgrimmar over every expansion, growing it because they they literally introduced Ogremar and you know it was a cool city it is a cool city but they introduced it as hey we just put some sticks together and here we are don't we very much my yum it's great fuck you <laughs> <laughs> well in in Warcraft 3 um the frozen throne you had a side scenario that you could play that was the creation of Ogremar so in mm. Warcraft 3 you played as Rexar um and you helped in the creation of Ogremar, which is really cool. So you know that Ogremar was literally just founded. And then World of Warcraft came out and it was just founded. You know, you compare that to Stormwind. You know, I don't know if you've walked around Stormwind. Yeah, Stormwind is amazing. Like that's an established city. It's been there. Like that for for all the Alliance has, that's a beautiful city, fleshed out. Like those well, are that cool and you districts. have the those tram, the spots. underground sub that goes to uh, Ironforge. Oh yeah. So I mean comparatively Ogremar was was not as cool and classic, but I will say every expansion it grew. They added on. Um, there was the uh, what was the what was the area in the very top, like the spirit pools or like where the healers were. I think yeah, like that. I think it was like the top but, left. Yeah, but like they they it grew every expansion. Ogremar grew and grew and grew. That was what was really cool about it. Well, I like, but the, I think even if the city had been smaller, it was that that like 
it was one of those moments where you see it out of a fucking movie where like oh, yeah. you know the main character comes to the city and the, the airship flies over their head like it timed it perfectly like when it happened I, I vividly remember that and I'm like wow this feels like right out of a movie and then I keep on walking like holy shit the city is like actually like a city it just it, it blew my mind and you're right Stormwind is incredibly like intricate and detailed and it's a lot more in depth but fuck you Orgrimmar is better <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting how because they have to kind of play with that balance of like the spectacle of how large it is, but also not making it too large because you still want to have people be able to like walk to each thing that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like in in Wrath, when uh, Dalaran became the, the like the main city that you all went to, that was mm-hmm. much more compact and like very convenient because everything you needed was right there like you know, two steps away but uh you definitely lose that spectacle on that scale yeah that was a great city actually i love that that was one of my favorite expansion cities to go to mm-hmm. like little port hubs even shastra yeah shastra and, was uh, cool. it was cool it was good it was a little too open empty but like it was good mm-hmm. That's what when I when I first went back to BC and I saw Shatrath, I'm like, this is the big city everyone's talking about. And I was kind of underwhelmed by it, but that was just it's a little know. barren. Yeah. But also remember, I was playing during Wrath, so no one was there. So yeah, not sure. only yeah. is it barren, but there's also no players there at all or very Fair few. Enough. Fair uh, enough. Yeah, um, Classic was great with the, their cities, though. It definitely felt alive. Thunder Bluff was also really fucking cool. Just like up on those giant cliffs. Yeah. Mulgore was great. Um, if you wanted to play a walking simulator, you played as Taran. <laughs> yeah, man, you just you just Mulgore took forever to get a into huge it. Huge starting area. Great starting area. Love it. Love the vibe. Love Thunder Bluff. But like, what a what a walk from all the way from Mulgore, Southern Barrens to Northern Barrens. Like, just mm-hmm. incredible. That's why I always played uh, Undead because I just I, the Undead just got you right into it. You went from that to Silver Pine Forest. You just didn't have to walk forever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, Trisfall Glades right into Silver Pine. The, I think the Hinterlands. And, and then you get down to Hillsbrad, which is what you were talking about before with all the PvP. Oh, yeah. The um, Hinterlands. Oh, that's a, that's a level 40 or 50 area. The oh, is it level 40, 50? Oh, yeah. The Hinterlands was great. That's one of the areas that you can just find like these weird-ass purple world drops. Um, I love that. Oh, love the that they've got that whole like troll city. Yeah, you have to go through that, and that's like you get not like a dungeon, a, but a dungeon. Yeah, you get like a stack of a bunch of like five man elite quests, mm-hmm. and you get your group, and you're basically doing a dungeon, but you're just going like up and up these like tiers, climbing up to the top of the city where there's like some sort of. Uh, like a ritual like a, up there. Yeah, there's some sort of ritual. Was there like spiders or like brood queens or something up there? Man, I forget what was back there. I, I, I truly do now, but that was a great one. Yeah, I think one of the one of the quests had you like collecting eggs. Another one was like take the take the lady's scepter or whatever. But that no, was I just like remember super... the one that was killed the specific types of trolls mm-hmm. that would take forever. Right. Yeah, because you they're like, ooh, get the they get the trap master, like the mm-hmm. the hunter types, but there's only warlock types for like the last three tiers of you climbing, and you're like, <laughs> where are the hunter ones? <laughs> you get people start leaving your group because they've all finished theirs because they were there oh yesterday, gosh. and then you're like, <laughs> just alone you're trying to survive. Real. That's happened a couple times. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. That good, good memories, good memories. <laughs> um. Any other any other locations in the world you'd like to highlight before we move on to talk a little bit of PvP, which I know Jamie is like one of your favorite PvP's. aspects of of the game. Uh, so good, but yeah, any other zones that you want to touch on or cities you want to talk about? Oh uh, man, I mean, this will will stick with the PvP as well. But like Ashenvale, I think was really Ash- good. Mm-hmm. Uh, the music was a was a vibe. You know, I always went to. Um... Oh my god, the mountain there. It's really killing me. That I, I, instead of going to Ashenvale, I always went up the mountain. And I cannot remember the mountain's name for me. Ashara, right Fellwood, Darkshore, Winter Spring. No, no, no. no. Those are the it's high level areas. It's a mountain, not a zone. No, it was the zone. I just can't remember. Oh, uh, was it Stone Talon? Thank you, Stone Talon. Yeah, That's yeah. It. I always went to Stone Talon instead of Ashenvale. Um, I always just like that area better. You know, I didn't do this when I originally played in Vanilla. But going through in Classic... 
I took the time to actually like read through all of the quests, like actually <laughs> absorb the story. And the way that the quest structure actually worked was really impressive. Like if you just trust the system and you mm-hmm. just go with it, because like usually you think like, oh, I want to get 20 quests. I'm going to have a full quest log and I go out into the zone and do them all and then be done with the zone. Right. But the way the quests work, they're like, no, no, no. We're going to give you a quest that tells you to go like from, you know, uh, the barons, like northern barons or whatever up to stone talon and then you can do a couple quests in stone talon and then stone talon will be like oh hey by the way you should go back to the barons now that you've done all these quests because there's like something you need to take to that dude and you go back down there and you've leveled up a little bit and now there's new quests available and like if you just trust the system and just like even if it says like oh go uh yeah i know you're on eastern kingdoms but like go over to kalimdor for a little bit and you're just like okay whatever i'll go do that no, you're they'll, not wrong. They'll eventually that... send you back, and then you'll get all those quests done. And it's just, it was, uh, but it really the organic. traveling in that game was always crazy. Like mm-hmm. you're not wrong. Yeah, absolutely right. I was, I was always a big lore master guy. I read every single quest, followed the lore for each zone. But man, when they told you to go to the other continent, I was like, I don't got an hour to burn. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. you would have right. to travel to Dorator just to get to take the the Zeppelin to get over there, right? Was that how it was in right. Nella as well? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you had to take the zeppelins between continents for sure. Now, is there? Hold on. Are there zeppelins to? Hold on. So I'm trying to remember. There's zeppelin. Dorator can take you up to Silver Pine Forest, or it could take you down to Stranglethorn Vale. Stranglethorn Vale. Right. Um, wasn't there two other zeppelins that would take you to different spots, like? Later on, like like Northrin and stuff like that. But those well, I'm not are the talking about Northrin. I'm talking about other locations on the eastern and uh, Kalimdor and the western kingdom or whatever it is. So I uh, I think in in Vanilla it was just those three mm-hmm. Zeppelin posts, but really? then there were also ships. So from like Gadgetstan to Booty Bay. Yep. And then like yes. the various ones that Menethil Harbor connects to, if you're Alliance, no alliance. or Brave. Yeah, they <laughs> more brave. I like that. Yeah, they had a whole boating system there. Like the night elves needed the boats to get around for sure. Oh yeah, from Teldrassil to like Moonglade and Darkshore and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What one of the things I adore about this game is just the. And I don't think you can really be. You can't achieve this in any other style of game except for an MMO. And obviously, WoW is has become the most popular MMO for for good reason, but like. The fact that, like, you know, Tristan, when you were describing Pharrellis or Jamie, when you were talking about Hills Brad, like, you knew, ex- like, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience in Hills Brad, but like, Tristan, you knew exactly where he was talking about. You re- you could remember the layout mm-hmm. of the land. Uh, that was how I could remember. I, when you're talking about Pharrellis, it was the same for me when you were talking about Pharrellis or in like Angoro Crater, and you can picture the dinosaurs and the, the cliffside that takes you down from. Uh, for a, or a thousand needles down the path to Angora Crater at the bottom, and then at the bottom of Angora Crater, you can come out the sides of like Tenaris or Stilthalis or Stilthalis. Um, like you have very like it, the world feels so fully fleshed out, even if the like the the biomes that they choose don't always make a whole lot of sense. Like, why is Tenaris like a desert wasteland, and then it sinks into this tropical crater? All of a sudden, like it. Whoa, 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 my man. El Girl Crater was the uh, playground of the gods to create life. There's a whole backstory there. It's still a desert next to a tropical crater. Uh, <laughs> is that why they had all like the, those crystal architecture yeah. things? Interesting. They, even, they actually even revisited Unguru Crater in a later expansion. And you, um, you went and visited like the creators, like the dwarf gods that they follow. Oh. And they, they even go and talk about how Unguru Crater was like a testing ground for like creating life and this and that. And, you know, mm-hmm. so they, they, they definitely f- fleshed out that area more uh, in later expansions, at least, I should say. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was all there. Well, because they had originally planned to make a either a dungeon or a raid in southern Tenaris, right, where they have like those big gates. Um, and I think that was supposed to be like some kind of uh, like well, old war type. Well, they did the uh, the caverns of time there. They did do the caverns of time, but I, I'm 
I swear there were some other large doors that in in some uh, some ruins farther farther south. Isn't there mm-hmm. isn't there a dungeon there? Oh, um, you know what? I'm thinking of the wetlands. The wetlands. Okay. The wetlands. I actually don't know too much about. Okay. That's that's more alliance territory. For yeah. Me. There's. It's like uh, I don't know level thirty ish area with like spiders and gators and stuff. But if you go farther in, there are actual like dragonkin that I think you oh. need for some probably actually yeah for those key quests for uh yes for black rock spire and 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 whatnot and you know um, i can't even remember it now um and i feel really dumb for just recalling this in the hinterlands there was a whole bridge that led to that same exact type of situation you were talking about mm-hmm. the dragonkin over there and i cannot for life of me recall what that was for or what that was about ever going over there i believe that was one of the world dragons that spawned over there Is that one of the world dragons? yeah because i'm remembering that i know there was I just remember there was one in the Swamp of Sorrows. There was the Tanneris one. There was the uh, uh, Hinterlands one. So I know there was three there. There's one and in Ashara. Ashara, that's right. Uh, I believe Ashenvale has one as well. Did Ashenvale? I, I know that there was a, a loop around one of those Night Elf areas. Was it the Wetlands, maybe? You're right. I think the Wetlands did have that dragon there. You're right. Because that was yeah, there was a lot more dragons than I, than I could recall. We just yeah, did that as yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember when we did that in classic, you know, a couple of years ago. Our guild was like, "Yo, let's do it! Everybody get on!" And we just went and banged them all out. And I remember our our guild leader, somebody found a warlock who got a ton of cash that day because he just summoned in our entire guild from one continent to the next, and we just knocked <laughs> out all those dragons in like forty five minutes. That's fantastic. It, it, yeah, I couldn't even tell you where we went. Well, just to and just to bring it back then to what I was saying, like the world the, about the world feeling so lived in. You both of you just went all, down a trip down memory lane about specific areas and specific places within each like zone. Um, and I just I don't know. I think that's one of the biggest compliments I can give this game. That regardless, like if you don't like the gameplay style or you don't like the quest structure or I mean. The story's good, but if you don't like the story, whatever. But like one thing this game consistently does well is that it makes you feel like this world is real, that it's fully fleshed out, like it is a living and breathing place. Um, and I can't say that for other games that have like cities or like big world maps or like uh you know, that kind of thing. Like this this actually feels real and lived in and like there's something always, especially because of all the player characters, there's always something happening somewhere else. I just, I, I love how this world feels and both the visuals and just the, the way it's designed. It's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. The early expansions definitely had something about their, uh, their worlds that felt really good. Like the, like you said, the entire world felt populated. And I don't know. I can't really speak very clearly because again, last expansion I played was Warlord at Draenor and that was forever ago now. But I felt like in Warland Draenor and even uh, Miss Pandaria, you go to an area, you would knock out all the quests, you go to the next area, and like that was it. There was no other, like really returning to areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so I felt like it was very much just go play these areas for your 10 levels to get to your max level and then just run some dungeons and then do end game content. The only area that you saw other players in was just when they started introducing the daily quests, like the daily islands, and and that was the only time you ever bumped into other players again. But the early expansions, the early games really had you going everywhere. It's also worth noting that you didn't get flying mounts until Burning Crusade. So like you, yeah. you literally had to walk everywhere. You couldn't just skip stuff and like fly over. Like you there's always well, even getting the regular holding. mounts was crazy expensive back in Nilla. Mm-hmm. Nah. Free warlock mount. All the way, mm. all the way. <laughs> was there a free warlock mount? Oh, you son of yeah, a bitch! Yeah, warlocks got free mounts. Well, the, we just we just summoned our dread steeds. The uh, the epic mount was a was a whole quest line that you had to get all sorts of reagents and that's true, through, right? Like because I had that's done that with, uh, on my paladin for the the charger. Okay, okay. Um, well, what I what I was going to say was um, PvP? the. Uh, well, hold, we'll get into PvP. Sorry, the <laughs> last thing I wanted to say was the uh, with, what you were saying, Jamie, about the quest structure. I think that that's a really good point because, in a weird sense, by streamlining the quest structure so that way you only have to you know you can do everything and move on to the next area. 
you you don't really get to live in each zone you just are kind of guests in each zone um and shout out to friend of the show dave jackson from tales of the backlog he did an episode on this kind of idea a while ago maybe it was like last year or something like that maybe earlier this year about like do games need to be fun and what he means by what he means by that is like sometimes there are certain things in a game where it may not seem like fun on the surface and it may be like oh i have to walk all the way over here oh i have to do all this over there but then once you do it you realize that while it wasn't like necessarily quote unquote fun at, in the moment it became enjoyable afterwards because of what it like what it taught you and what it gave you that you didn't realize that you wanted if that makes sense so it to bring it back to wow here with the quest with the quest structure getting more streamlined you know it made sense when if you think about it on the surface level because it's like oh my god i don't feel like running up and down the barrens over and over and over again um but by doing so even though it was huge and obnoxious and annoying like you you memorize specific areas of the barons and the barons has his own very like unique feeling all all its own to itself because it becomes so memorable and i I feel like by doing that by not giving players constantly streamlined choices you end up with these really unique situations and memories that can only be achieve like baron's chat was a thing because the barons was so goddamn big people would just go and hang out in the barons and bullshit for all day long bullshit Uh, more like you'd hear them do chuck norris jokes all night long exactly (laughs) yeah like and also you're talking about looking for places you got the you got chuck norris jokes and you got where the hell is man kirk's wife Uh (laughs) i don't i don't know that reference oh no it's a quest and it literally just said he's looking man kirk is looking for his wife Somewhere to the south, go find her. And people would <laughs> not go far enough south and be like, where the hell is it? it every tw- 12 minutes, every 20 minutes, where's Mankirk's wife? Where the hell's Mankirk's wife? I've already walked <laughs> up and down the barrens. Where is she? <laughs> it, was a, it was a big thing. That's real. It, it's funny though, but like that, that, that level of inconvenience for the player ended up creating a memory that players still reminisce back to now. And like a fond one in a weird way. Like, yes, it wasn't necessarily fun, but it created a good experience, which is such a weird, it sounds contradictory, you know? Um, but it only works in MMOs for sure. If I well, had to do it in a single player game, I'm like, no, thank you. Well, yeah, no, I am like this type, but, this, right. it, but it depends, it depends on what it is for the game. Like certain, if like a first person shooter, what would be considered not fun, but you would still end up having a good experience. That would be a completely different game mechanic. But, specifically yes for wow what i'm talking about here is that the the quest structure not being streamlined but being somewhat linear like as you were describing tristan how it guides you in different directions and lets you kind of piecemeal take like explore the world there was a purpose to it it was to give you that bigger sense of the world around you even though it probably took you a little bit longer to do um and i i I, it's kind of interesting i don't know i kind of miss what game developers didn't streamline absolutely everything and with that said i don't you know what would i feel that way if a new game came out and it wasn't streamlined i'd be like what the fuck we already learned this lesson like would i would i still be cranky about it you know i don't know but looking back at wow it's just like you can see some of the things you're missing by having that streamlined option available i'll tell you i I always thought it was a sad day when uh flying mounts were brought into azeroth like flying mounts in in um burning crusade and only burning crusade fine but when you brought it back into the eastern kingdoms calendar i was like Ugh, all right i think didn't they only bring that back once um cataclysm came though yeah, yeah but that, and that made sense though because they added more verticality to the cat because cataclysm completely changed the map of the mm-hmm. main game so by doing so it gave the designers a chance to add more verticality which made flying mounts actually viable otherwise it wasn't even needed on the original game anyway uh we can we can go into pvp though jamie this is your time to shine my friend you you're a pvp fiend oh. what what do you want to talk about with pvp i mean i don't know everything about pvp was great except for the very first one horse on gulch man love and hate it it's the very first battleground um Obviously, it was really cool to play, except any game that makes me do capture the flag is awful. <laughs> I remember hating Warsong Gulch after a while, just because the, the games would either stalemate 
or one side would would just clearly dominate the other and would be over yeah uh, it got really good to me when um Earth Eye basin came out that was my jam that was the whole flag capture but all, uh, no i'm sorry not the flag capture it was the uh the base capturing you actually had to strategize leave some people behind attack as a group um that was the best and then also like let rogues do their thing like they could hide and ambush people warlocks because i played a warlock you know i love that stuff because a warlock back in classic could, could take on two or three different classes depending on what they were you got the sucky bus to charm somebody you got fear you got howl terror group fear you dot them all up i don't know that was that was that was peak warlock action right there did you do any pvp tristan uh yeah i had done a decent amount back in in her og vanilla um where it was like and again you get that sense of community because the you didn't have battle groups yet so yeah. it's just your server and it'd be like okay it's like our guild's pvp night let's go and then so we were alliance and there would be the horde guild that was like proper end game like full tier two and we were still kind of just like doing cg <laughs> we're like i guess we're just screwed today yeah that's actually true because back then you would make a level one character on a server you'd walk into a major city and you'd start chatting like yo is this a horde server or is this an alliance server who wins most of the fights and people would tell you i think on um um the website um, I, I can't remember we already referenced it i forget what it was um they would have which servers leaned more alliance and which were more horde as far as like a player base but then you would go into them and like i said you'd find out which one would actually win the battlegrounds more frequently okay. because mm -hmm. then like tristan said you're you're server fighting you're not cross realming it's you see the same people and a lot of those those end game battlegrounds and you know whether you're going to win or lose right away like you're like oh well, well this mf is coming in here with end game gear right <laughs> and i'm just like i don't know i'm a fresh 60 what's going on yeah i can remember playing a lot of warsong gulch uh like leveling up and again like as a hunter i was usually uh guarding the flag and like throwing flares looking for for rogues yeah um and like arathi basin i was sitting up on lumber mill dropping traps and like kiting people around the lumber mill and just basically like sitting there until someone came and then be like help <laughs> um but like alterag valley was my jam jesus christ i, I mean like what even a time hole even in like you know you're you've again we were on like a low pop server so there would only be one alterag valley game happening and you'd be like in queue waiting for somebody to like afk out or whatever so that you could jump in and take their place and it would be like the game would go on for like days sometimes because people You're would right. be turtling so hard. And there was no timer. It was just whenever it ended, it ended. And at some point, I don't even know what expansion or when, they just decided, nah. And every faction would just run past each other and it would just be a, a base race. But before people did that, it was it was just so long. But like that was that was an area where, again, as a hunter, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to get up high. And I'm just going to like multi shot into the crowd. And I think that's where I got like most of my honor. Um, tagging people? Yeah, like tagging people and just like, <laughs> well, <laughs> I did my part, you know? <laughs> but like, even so, I think uh, playing in classic as an orc hunter, I only ever got to like, I don't know, Master Sergeant or something, like rank four or five. Yeah, and I think on my alliance character, uh, I was a knight, which I think was rank six. Like I didn't, I didn't have it in me to do that that PvP grind. No, and and Josh, remember that in classic WoW uh, PvP, it was you were competing like a world rank system, so mm -hmm. you would push other people down as you climb the ladder. Like there was the warlord um, for the horde. And that was like the best PvP player. You would get that title. It was an achievement, I believe. Um, but you would have a Warlord title, which would unlock access to the Warlord class weaponry. Um, okay. So you're, you would have to play it 24-7. You didn't, you didn't do dungeons. You didn't do endgame. Other than that, you, you PvP. That was your endgame. Um, mm. So you would, you would uh, honor Harvest. And then you'd have to do better than other players in your faction to get that title because again you're, you're pushing people down i think it was on a weekly basis yeah every the week there would be one new high warlord mm -hmm. and then 
whoever had been High Warlord, if they stopped their grind, they would still have the title, but like they would drop down to Warlord so that a new High oh, Warlord okay. could take over. Yeah. And, like, so it was it was very much this is all you did day in, day out. Which again, once you get that High Warlord gear, you're set. But uh, and wasn't there like a whole bunch of people, the twinks that would basically like yeah. um, you would stop your character leveling? You, level yeah, you would stop leveling because PvP doesn't give you experience to level your character. So you would just pick a battleground that is like, you know, level, you know, what, 25 through 30 or some shit like that or whatever the yeah, range was. Every 10 levels. And the, the big one was level 19. Um, you would you would gear your guy out with uh, Wailing Caverns and Dead Mines. Uh huh. Here? get those van cleef sabers yep. that's it man and then you would just stop and that was it you would just be peak in your field and then of course based on your class is when you would like be peak in that level mm-hmm. so it all just depends like warriors were trash i i remember not liking my warrior very much <laughs> at early level because there was nothing i could do with a charge and then hit them with heroic strike and right. like stand around but like warlocks were really great at a certain point i think warriors were really good at level like 29 if i remember right because they get the ability to become fear immune for a little bit and they get their good stuff but yeah there were definitely twinks at each level they would just stop and they would play there and i never understood it i mean it looked fun for a little bit but uh, i think it's i I think it's just the idea of like being the best that you possibly can at a specific part of the game you know i always thought that was really cool like one of the things i always found interesting about wow was like how there was these hyper specific communities and niches that would evolve up around different things like whether it's the pvp servers which like the twink characters that would be the people who just play the same battleground obviously over and over and over again because they just love that one so much maybe or like you had the entire like industry of people who had focused so much on their professions that they would like craft things for other players for money and then turn it into a oh, business. The, and the then professions were huge. Well, there, there was someone cause it was the auction house in, in original. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yes, okay. For sure. So like there was, I don't, I, this could be anecdotal or this could be uh, uh what's the, what's the word apocryphal, I guess. I, I read somewhere that someone wrote like a college paper about, or like they're an economics mm-hmm. paper based around World of Warcraft because of the economy in the game. Like it's just nuts. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah def- it, was, it was a study. Definitely get like a good feeling of like supply and demand, and like people cornering the market on something, and they're the you know they have somebody farming all of the, I don't know, like the black lotus or something, so nobody else has them. And the thorium, and he, and yeah, yeah, it's just thorium. all over the eastern plague lands. Like I said, I had a warrior. That was just dual gathering. So it was mining and skinning, I think it was at the time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you just, everywhere I would go, I would just, the Eastern Playlands, I would just be there waiting for a group to pay me to run through a dungeon. I would collect all the thorium um, and then just hit it on the market house, uh, the auction house once the supplies got low. And that's how I made all my money. I can remember in Classic, I had, I was an engineer and I had gotten the schematic for a particular type of scope that you could put on your bows and i think at the time there was only one other person on the server that was making them oh man so i like i bought out all of the uh the ingredients that you needed for that Mm -hmm. and then i made a bunch and i bought out theirs and i put mine up and i was like this is how i'm going to level my engineering and also try to make all my money back that's amazing your capitalism was real Mm -hmm. for sure um what else was I gonna say about the auction house? Oh, no. oh, I can't remember. I had some good story about it. I, uh, it'll come back to me. The auction house was amazing, though. And if you remember, they had uh, a cross faction auction house in Tanneris mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, yeah. Bay too, which was always dead and awful and stupid. Well, it's because like, it, it would only be available to. So, like, there was essentially two separate auction house systems. There was your faction auction house system which you could access from any of the uh, like the auction, cities, yeah. auctioneers in the major cities or you could go to uh like you said in uh gadget stand in Tenaris or uh booty bay in Tranglethorn vale or any any of the the goblin cities because those are like neutral territories that like yeah. both alliance and horde could go to it's the one um, in winter spring as well 
Yes, there's one mm-hmm. up in Winter Spring as well. And so those oh, yeah, three, one. you could, there, there was like an auction house just for them, which I never understood why more people didn't use. It would basically have a bigger market. More people would be able to see it. Yeah, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. That's the problem. I think Gadgetan really and Stranglethorn Vale are easy to get to. Uh, Gadgetan and Booty Bay are easy to get to, though. Uh, you're still out of your way, going to a lower level area. I, I guess think so. what you would what you'd see a lot on there would be the faction specific pets that they'd be like, mm. "Ooh, do you want? I don't know, like a tabby or something that would be only available for humans oh, you're to right. buy." And they'd be like, "Ooh, yeah, I want to be an orc with a tabby. Let's go." <laughs> I remember in Booty Bay, it was the uh, the Stranglethorn Vale chapters that was always on sale there. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the the crazy diary that has like forty yep. pages to collect or whatever. The biggest sink on your inventory. Oh my god, it was so bad. Thank God they had the bank there, but yeah, it was so bad. You'd always have like f- like five different versions of the same page. Yo, and you want to talk PvP for a second? The Grubash Arena. The Grubash Arena. What a toxic environment that was. That's the one where it's not just PvP, it's everybody versus everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was every four hours, I think it was, something like that. Um, they put the treasure chest in the middle of the arena. And anybody that walked into the arena was fair game ally, you know, hor- horde alliance doesn't matter. You could turn in your friends, which mine sure as shit did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we'd go in there as rogues, and you know, you, you just don't know who's in there, man. You don't know who's got invisibility on as mage. You don't know how many rogues are in that arena because once you walk in, you're still tagged mm-hmm. uh, for for all types of combat for like maybe like a minute or something like that after you leave it. Um, and the corpses would just pile up, dude. What? What a fight that was. Well, and Stranglethorn Vale in general was just chaotic, especially outside of the Horde encampment in there. Oh, um, yeah. That was like, like, it was always just, you, it, it, I shouldn't say always, but there'd be always. points in the day, and it could be at any time. There, there wasn't always a rhyme or reason to it where you would just walk out and just start getting ganked by higher higher level alliance because they were they were coming down south to Booty Bay and they would just like decide to pop off take a couple uh, low level character players out and then move along. There's a lot of standoffs for sure. I remember mm-hmm. just just waiting with my guys, you know, the the guys I was playing with, we just watched one or two of them we're like we can take them. Let's do it. <laughs> you guys yeah, I am up. God, man, I, lo- I love it. Stranglethorn Vale is the best. Stranglethorn Vale and Hillsbrad. I miss world PvP so much. Now, if you want some end game world PvP, Syllabus. Syllabus. Oh, boy. A... Yeah, that's wild too. The, yeah, everybody's prepping right. for AQ. You're you're farming those uh, the hives. Mm-hmm. And there's like... and you actually share the same town too. Right, yeah. And you get I mean, we would be running out there in like groups of like three to five to be like farming this stuff. And then you'd have an alliance group of three to five would come in and they'd kill all of you and then make make their way through. And then you'd come back, res, get all healed up, and then you'd go wipe them out. And uh, you just have like roving bands of people kind of out in the desert between the hives killing each other. And, you know, that spills over into Unguru Crater and then it's just all a mess. Mm -hmm. It It was a lovely mess. Man, this game is just so fucking fun. I love this so much. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back and play it again for sure. Those poor saps that are like, oh, let's go run BRD. And there's a whole like 40 man <laughs> MC raid that just rolls over them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those are great. Those are great. I think we should use this, though, to start wrapping up the episode. I think we've covered a lot of the different aspects I wanted to. We've talked about some of the classes, some of the races. We've talked about the world. We've talked about some of like just the the... Honestly, what the, the, what I'm I really feel like we've been able to impart is just the overall communal aspect this game has brought. Because, like Tristan, Jamie, you guys didn't play with each other at all in the game, right? Like you didn't really interact playing WoW, right? Especially yeah. in Nilla. Nope. Uh, I think a little bit in Classic, right at the beginning. Um, the classic, yeah, because classic. we tried forming that guild. Yeah, that yeah, we had a guild for all the people that wanted to come back for it. And um, then uh, we did at least one MC raid together, right? I think so. Yeah, I know. I definitely, I find, I never did Molten Core originally back in the day because, like I said, the organization was awful. It took too long. Now with Classic, everybody knew what they were doing. It was a lot faster to get together. So I definitely know we did maybe one or two Molten Core runs. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, not back in the day, though. You got but, your Thunder Strike? I did get my Thunder Strike. <laughs> I was very happy about that for a long time. 
went right into PvP with it. But the fact that you both can share such similar experience, not similar, but like you, there, there's almost like a language involved with it, just like this communal language of like stuff that happened in World of Warcraft that like you you all can relate that you can both relate to because you experienced it back when it was contemporary and you still remember it all these years later. Like that, that's, that's hard to get in games. It's hard. Like games will leave an indelible memory on almost like when you, nostalgia is a hell of a drug is what I'm trying to say. But like world of Warcraft just had a different type of nostalgia, man. It just, I haven't really seen many other games do like hit that same way. It's just, it's an incredible game. So I, and I really feel like we kind of imparted that sense of community in this episode. So I'm really grateful how much we were able to talk about all the different, like just goofy things that that would come across, whether it's Baron's chat, whether it's all the shit in Arathi Highlands, whether it's the uh, Earth Eye base and like all the, all this stuff. It's just, it's, it, it's been a wonderful conversation. So I want to throw it over to both of you for just kind of final thoughts. Like what, any, any final things you want to say about the game that has not already been said. And then after that, just talk about like why you feel this game is important. Like I already kind of went into it for me, but like what, what do you guys think? So, Jamie, I'm going to start off with you. Um, any final words on the game and any and just why do you feel like this game is important? I mean, there's a reason they remade it, you know, a couple of years ago and people played classic. People played classic Britain Crusade, Frozen, you know, um, uh, all the expansions. Like It's because it was so good. And you're right. It is nostalgia. Um, but it was just like a, a peak period in MMO gaming because like, like we talked about before, there was no real quest mechanics before there was no real storyline in these other modes it was just fight level up and keep doing it but you know warcraft did a special thing where they released multiple games before this mmo created a rich story and then by the time you get into the mmo you know these people you know thrall you know the orcs you know their story you know the humans you know why they're a-holes you know jana proudmore you know why she's got her harbor down there like you know why and who all these people are which is a, a huge thing for an MMO to have a big backstory like that. It doesn't require you to read the manual or or figure out who they are in game. Mm-hmm. But the story aspect, the rich community where you needed people to pick professions, you needed to communicate to people, you needed to do look for groups, right? And then, of course, in the early days of the MMO when it was just chaos and nobody knew what the hell they were doing, that also just adds to the fun. Get people talking, get them engaged, have a friends list. you know. And when we were doing it, it was 2004. You know, so people from high school, you'd you would say, "Hey, I'm playing WoW." They'd get on. You after school, everybody gets on for a couple hours. You do it again. You talk about it. It was just also a period of time where, you know, as kids, we all rallied around it. I know I always had like a full five man party on at any point in time with my friends. We would just hop on. We'd run some stuff. We level. We do ults. We don't know what the hell the ults skills are or their abilities. We'd play it. We'd start in different locations. Like it was just, it was so big a game. You could enjoy it so many different ways. And I think, you know, that's what people like. And that's why classic was remade again, because it's just that, that great feeling of a solid game they put together with community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tristan, what about you? Yeah, I, uh, I really think it's the community that does it. And like, I, again, like in, in original vanilla, I played on a very low population server. So there wasn't that much of a community. Like a lot of the times, if you were looking for a group, there was like nobody around. Um, And like, it was still fun, but like, I don't think I got the full experience until classic when you had just so many people and like every city was just buzzing. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was like not hard to find a group. And like every, it was just, yeah, I just I just really think it's the the sense of community. Um, and Tristan, do you remember uh, what server you played on uh, originally? Yeah, uh, it was Agamagan. Okay, we always played on Blood Scout. Okay, high pop PvP server, all time. Gotcha. Wait queues almost every day. Nice, nice, nice. I nice. played on Death Rock. That was my main one. Yeah, Death Rock is where we had. Uh, we had jumped in Burning Crusade and, and Wrath. But uh, yeah, well, I, I think unless you have anything else to add, Tristan, uh, I think we're are you, are you, sorry. Do you actually have anything else to add? I just want to oh, sure yeah, to just just the, like the 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 sense of adventure and like really not knowing what anything did. 
because like yes. it was actually before Wowhead, we were using Thoughtbot, and that was like what the bot? Thoughtbot. I haven't heard that in forever. Actually, oh my god, T H O T T bot. Mm-hmm. That hoe over there bot. Two T's, not one. <laughs> <laughs> that over there, there. Yeah. Um, where it was like, you'd be like, oh man, what is this item? And like, where can I get it? And you'd look it up there and it would be like, well, here's the item. And then you'd have to like go down to the comments to see if anybody like shed any light on it. And it was just like, nope, there's nothing on here to tell me what this does. And like, I can remember going to, uh, I think it's Dire Mall East, the one where there's like the, the King Ogre. And you kill him, and then you become the the new king. And all the other bosses in the instance, if you didn't kill them, they will come and pledge allegiance to you and give you a gift in the form of another piece of gear. What? Yeah. And in order to get past one guy, you have to craft a suit that makes you look like an ogre. And then you can be like, hey, there's like some stuff going on at the entrance to the instance, and you should go see what's going on with that. And he'll be like, okay, I'll go check it out. And then you can walk past him in your ogre suit, and you can do like the uh, the Chris Farley Chippendales dancer dance as an ogre. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but I can remember uh, our like our class lead hunter was taking me through there because there's a really good two handed weapon from the emperor for hunters. And he was like, okay, so I'm going to give you this item. And you just got to hang on to that until a particular part. Like, don't touch it until I tell you. And of course, I accidentally right click it. So I'm just out in the middle of Feralus as this big ogre doing the Chris Farley dance and having like just a great time. And I know looking back now, the class lead was probably like, Jesus Christ, I had to I had to do so much prep work to find all the materials to the, for that to make it for you so that we could do this and now you just wasted it <laughs> we can't even <laughs> run the thing anymore but like just shit like that that like any any more you're like because everything's so min maxed and you can just google or like reddit how exactly how to do things and it's still a really good game and i still really enjoy the community but that sense of wonder i think is is partially lost now with the 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 more maturity of the the internet that's true and i think even in game now they've got like a book that tells you how every fight in every dungeon plays out so it's like it kind of takes away some of that like surprise about what what's going to happen or how things are supposed to happen mm-hmm. exactly I, I that that sense of wonder is hard to reclaim because like you both said like it just it's so much information is out there now same thing like i got the same vibe from minecraft when i first played it like you didn't know what all the recipes were just yet so you're just trying different things um but now you can just they, they literally have it in game now they give you all the recipes in game um and it's kind of similar with wow now or they, they give you a lot of that information now in game or you just go to wowhead or something like that mm-hmm. and everything is laid out for you and i understand that for convenience i'm not even saying to get rid of that but like sometimes just not knowing makes it that much more interesting giving letting you letting your imagination run wild and you know back when this came out i i do think it lent a lot of that uh i do think it helped this game a lot like the game was incredibly well made it's not the only reason but i think it helped establish that you know that immersion that i was obsessing about earlier on in the episode like i'm with you on this i I think that sense of wonder is really important but yeah i think that's all we got for this episode i we've been going on for almost two hours now on world of warcraft i think that's a, a good place to wrap up thank you both so much for joining me for this one this was a really great conversation and uh, uh honestly a nice distraction from the shit that's happening in real world in the real world which we're we're not going to say we we don't need to burden <laughs> my audience with with that shit right now um but if if you uh when this is coming out if you know something is something big happened in recent current events you'll you'll you could probably put two and two together well Unless something crazy happens between now and when this episode comes out, then people might be confused. Anyway, um, (laughs) I'm going to stop talking. Thank you both so much for joining me. This was awesome. Tristan, Jamie, I don't believe either of you have social media, but is there anything you would like to promote? Any, is there actually any social media you'd like to plug any of that stuff? Nope. I'm, I'm moving to a 
to a hovel where no one will find me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got nothing either. But uh, if you're ever in Warcraft, look up Bishop the Orc Warrior. I'll be hanging around tanking something. Are you still playing it? No, I mean, I'm going to get back into it pretty soon. <laughs> After this episode, yeah. I mean, it, it I mean I've got gives a couple people itch. queued up. They want to play it. You know, I've been the. Uh, I end up the World of Warcraft board game that's based off the classic version of WoW. So, you know, oh, we're getting it for sure. I forgot. You also said like beforehand to prep for this, you had your World of Warcraft Trivial Pursuit game. Oh, yeah. I'm just flipping through cards. Because <laughs> all the way up to Mr. Pandaria. That's so awesome. As for myself, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky. I'm at still loading pod over there. I've... Uh, lock down my Twitter, so don't bother with that. You can follow, you can, you can find me on Twitch at Still Loading Pod, at Still Loading Podcast on YouTube as well. If you would like to support the show, you can do so in a number of ways. You can give it a five star rating or review on whichever podcasting app you use. It does help more people find the show, and it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. And I like feeling warm and fuzzy. But you, if you would like to support the show monetarily, there is a Patreon, patreoncom slash Pod. For a dollar a month, you get all the episodes. It's earlier with better audio quality, along with patron voting rights. Uh, there are quarterly polls as well as uh, every year in January, I do a backlog month poll where basically I have my patrons vote for four different games that I will cover later on in the year, all in October for backlog month. Um, so that's all for a dollar. You get a bunch, you can help guide the direction of the show and you get the episodes earlier with better audio quality for $3 a month. You get everything I mentioned prior plus uh, patron shout outs. Like you heard at the beginning of this episode for $4 a month, you get everything I mentioned prior plus too many bonus episodes. And for $5 a month, you get all of it. The, the patron shout outs, the early access, the voting rights, the bonus episodes and access to my monthly movie podcast, which uh, this is coming out in November. So the next one, uh, the, the most recent one was the finale of my Still Bonding series, my monthly James Bond movie podcast where me and a bunch of friends bonded over 007. Now we're moving on to Fast and Furious, which is going to be called Still Family, where all the guests who join me aren't just friends, they're family. Uh, so you can check all that out at patreon.com slash Uh But that's it. That is all the time I have for you for this episode. Sincerely, thank you all so much for listening. Tristan, Jamie, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And with all that said, listeners, I will see you all next time.